Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today for this new lecture. Um, all Septodon team is pleased to welcome you to discuss about management of deep cavities using viable field technique presented by uh, Professor Sabag. Professor Sabag, thank you uh, to be here today with us. Thank you, good evening, uh, Emily, good evening, everybody. Uh, to introduce you to the audience, uh, you are graduated from Saint Joseph University in Beirut. You have a master in operative dentistry. You have certificates of advanced studies in biomaterials and operative dentistry. You have a PhD in biomaterials, and uh, in 2020, you obtain a HDR degree. Um, currently, you are uh, an associate professor and the head of the Department of Restorative Dentistry and Endodontics in the Lebanese University. And you are also the director of several research projects. You published uh, many papers uh, in international peer review of dental journal. Uh, and you are a member of the Academy of Operative Dentistry in USA, the editorial board of Reality Journal, the International Association of Dental Research, and fellow of the International College of Dentists. So what is going to happen uh, today during, during this internative webinar? First part, the lecture. So this lecture is recorded. It's in English with subtitles in Spanish. The second part, it will be just after the lecture. Dr. Sabag will be here with us to answer to all your questions. And we want also to hear from you. So there will be so, so, some small polls. And the end of the webinar, there will be a satisfaction survey. So please answer because it helps help us a lot to answer to your expectation. One last comment before starting the lecture. We had small problems of uh, network during the record at the beginning and just at the end. So don't worry, it's not your computer, uh, it's the network. So please stay with us until the end. Don't quit the webinar. Um, enjoy the lecture and see you in around 45 minutes. Thank you. Enjoy the lecture and see you later. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, webinar. I want to thank you for attending and thank Septu interesting topic that management of deep cavities using uh, biobalfield techniques and we know about field materials is now a very important category recognized in the world of density let's try to see what's going around so first this paper that was two years ago by Haynes and Rousson this is a kind of meta analysis about that plus two composites we see that we spend a lot of time in our daily practice as dentists to place direct composite. And if you look into this meta-analysis, we see that 261 millions of direct composites are placed every year by dental practitioners. And according to the guidance on posterior resin composite that was published by the American Academy of Operative Dentistry, the European section, and I'm very proud to be a member of this uh, very prestigious academy. This paper was published in um, Operative Dentistry, the journal of the academy, and they try to define the indications of posterior composites. First, it can be for the treatment of primary lesion, replacement of inlays, repair of existing restoration, and in some cases, the restoration of endodontically treated teeth, the restoration of fractured and cracked teeth, and also when we are facing tooth wear and erosion, this indication. So we see that we have a lot of situations where we use composites to um, restore our cavities. But the problem is sometimes we have small cavities, as you can see on the left side. Sometimes we have bigger cavities, as you can see over there. And this is the whole problem of the management of deep cavities, because one solution could be to remove to make a root canal treatment, remove the nerve, and then we are facing the situation where we need maybe to crown. And with young patients, this is not always a good solution because if you look at those cavities on the bottom of the slide even more, you see that we have deep cavities and it would be really good to try to save the pulp for those tissues. And what is the problem? We can define very briefly 
problematic of a deep cavity is we have two problems. First, the cusp weakness. Sometimes we are close to the pulp, and in other situations, we are in the pulp, so we have exposed the pulp. And for this, we need to find some uh, techniques and solutions for those two issues. And when we talk about the concept of bulk fill, this means a monolayer. So we don't use stratification or layering. We rather place all the material in one layer inside the cavity. So in this situation, we have different indications and application. First, it can be in pediatric dentistry. As you can see, this is a first molar, and we know that those molars are the first to erupt in the dental uh, uh, cavity. So in the buccal cavity, sorry, so we see that we have sometimes very deep and severe caries that we need to treat and try to preserve the pulp and the tooth of this young patient that is sometimes 10 years or 15 years old. So this is a typical indication where we have removed the caries and we have placed a bulk fill material to preserve the pulp. So according to uh, the AAPs, what is the definition of a vital pulp therapy? According to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, preserving the pulp uh, vitality is the placement of a protective barrier over exposed or unexposed pulp to induce the formation of a dentinal bridge and maintain its vitality and function. This can be achieved through several situations or several techniques. First, by placing very easily a protective base and an indirect pulp treatment. Second situation, we place a direct pulp capping when the pulp is exposed. Of course, this needs to follow some uh, criteria very strictly. And the last situation is to preserve the roots of the tooth and to remove the uh, pulp of the uh, pulp uh, of the crown. So this is called pulpotum. So I will try to take you in this journey to see what are the different clinical situations. With my group, we have published a paper about direct pulp capping several years ago. A very interesting paper, very easy and very accessible for clinicians. And this was based on a kind of frequently asked question. So we ask a question and we try to answer. For instance, how a dental bridge is formed, is pulp capping indicated for primary teeth? What is the best technique for cavity disinfection? And this paper was published in Dental Update in 2014. And already we could classify and talk about several categories of bulk fill uh, biomaterials to preserve the pulp. We had the uh, classical calcium hydroxide that is not really a, a bulk fill. Then we moved to the MTA, then we moved to the biosilicate, biodentine, that was really among one of the first bio bulk materials and now I have an experience of almost 10 years and plus using this material. So whole, also a recent classification of those materials published in Dental of uh, Dental Materials Journal published in Japan about the current status of direct pulp capping materials for permanent teeth. Pulp capping materials can be classified into two main groups. The first one is based on calcium hydroxide and in this case we have two groups. We have the water-based and we have the resin-based materials. And in the other situation, we have the calcium silicate-based materials, where you have the hydraulic MTA cements, and on the other side, you have the resin-modified MTA cements. So we see that now we have a lot of materials, and sometimes this is creating a confusion for us. First, we have the very classical calcium hydroxide that we have been using since years when I was a student and even before, if you look in the textbooks, you will find that this is a product that is used where you have a pH of 11 and this product can be based on water or resin. It is soluble, we have weak properties and we have the inhibition of the hybrid layer also. So it's not always uh, easy to use only this product. We need to know how to use it and in which situation. We have uh, several examples. We have the live from Kerr, the Dical from Dentsply, and the Calcimol from Voco. This is a typical case where we have a very small palpable exposure on a molar in uh, young patients, and we have placed a small layer of calcium hydroxide. And problem is we need to protect this calcium hydroxide because as we mentioned earlier, it has weak mechanical properties and it is hydrosoluble for the best 
is to place a layer of uh, glass ionomer, light cure. In this case, we placed a, a small layer of vitro bond. And then we can place a temporary restoration. And then we need to wait. This is what we were taught to wait for six weeks or a month and a half to make sure that we don't have any signs of pain. And then we need to bring back the patient to drill, to remove the restoration and to place a final one because this kind of restoration cannot uh, stay for uh, permanently. So this again shows that we have a complex situation where we have several materials placed in one session and then we remove the material temporarily and we place the composite. Also with MTA, this is another case also made with MTA, a pulp exposure with a young patient. We had deep caries as you can see even a class one sometimes can be very deep. So what we did, we placed MTA, gray color, and we have also some uh, specification and some guidelines to use the MTA. We need to place a uh, cotton that is a little bit wet and then to place a temporary uh, cement and then to remove it. <coughs> Sorry, and then to uh, place the final composite in the cavity. So we see that sometimes it's a little bit complex process besides uh, this material, we had a lot of material that were called MTA-like products. So this is a big list coming from several manufacturers. Of course, the first one was the ProRoot gray version, then we had the white version, then we had the MTA Angelus from uh, Brazil, then we had the Endo-E's MTA. So a lot of materials were coming from uh, this uh, category. So we see that we uh, have a lot of products today on the market, and this is a typical example of what we can see over there. And uh, finally, we have the handling of the MTA. We have the high price, the risk of staining, and the long uh, setting time, as you can see. So it's not very easy to use the MTA. And finally, we need to know where to use this uh, material and in which uh, situation, because we need always to plate the material and to handle it with care. And here we have also a new material coming from uh, Alterdent also. It's called Activa Bioactive. It's strong, it's aesthetic, it's bioactive, and it can be used as base or liner. And according to the manufacturer, they say that it is releasing and charging with calcium, with phosphate, and sometimes uh, also they say that it will release fluorides more than glass ionomer. Those materials have been uh, recently released. We don't have that much experience with those materials so we still need to investigate and see if those materials are uh, giving good clinical evidence and they have a good longevity regarding the pulp vitality and now we can move to uh, biodentine that i have been using since uh, almost 10 years and this product was launched by septodon and it presents in a box where you have 15 uh, capsules and uh, water uh, blisters inside, but I think that now the packaging was reviewed and every box contains five uh, capsules and five uh, water dispenser. It's very important to keep those products in the sealed uh, tightly um, uh, foil because it's very sensitive to humidity and water. So just you open it whenever you want before using it. So as you can see, this uh, material uh, is composed of a powder and liquid. The powder is mainly based on tricalcium silicate. This is the main core component. We have also the dicalcium silicate, and this is the second main component. And we have the calcium carbonate based basically on the fillers. And we have, for the sake of radio opacity, we have the zirconium oxide and some iron oxides as well. Concerning the liquid, it is mainly based on calcium chloride that serves as an accelerator. We have also the hydrosoluble polymer and the water. So how to apply this material? It's very easy. So you need to open the capsule to dispense the water inside and to close it and put it on the vibrator. We will come to this in a few minutes. So how does the pathway of biodentine function? So biodentine stimulates the release of transforming growth factor B from pulpal cells stimulating reparative dentin formation. And basically it will initiate odontoblast differentiation and hence produce tertiary dentin by cell signaling and thus will ensure the closure of uh, the pulp exposure and the healing of uh, the dental tissue. Concerning the biological properties of biodentin, biodentin is placed in one layer from the pulp to the top of the cavity. So we can call it biobulk because it 
avoids placing several materials, regardless of how deep is the cavity, we can place it from the bottom. So if we have a path exposure and we can use it up all the way up to the occlusal part. And then of course we leave it uh, temporarily and we have uh, several studies that show that this material can be left for up to uh, six months. Then it's a bioactive material that promotes the pulp self-healing capacity and ensures high cell viability. It exhibits an amount of antibacterial activity because the pH is 12, so we know that this is very important. And also this material has a low porosity that leads to high mechanical strength because you know that if you have a material with porosity, this can be a weak point. And also, as I mentioned, biodentin can be left as a temporary up to six months, but needs to be replaced by a composite for a number like aesthetics and resistance. Because this material, you will see, you will see that it has a, like a chalky uh, color, but it is very resistant once it's set. And I think that uh, Professor Colon did a lot of investigation about this, and he was one of the first to publish evidence that this material can last for up to six months in the mouse. So now let's move into some clinical situations where we have first, for instance, a direct pulp capping using biodentin that was performed in this patient. You see the cavity is quite deep and you know that one of the rules of doing a pulp capping is to obtain, as we said, the hemostasis. So we need to take a small cotton pellet to perform a good compression on these uh, tools to make sure that we don't have uh, bleeding, excess bleeding, and within two minutes we need to have a uh, pulp that is not bleeding anymore, and then we can place the biodentin totally from the exposure pulp to the occlusal pulp. You keep the patient for 10 minutes, we clean using a small cotton pellet, the surrounding of the tools, and then uh, we wait, and this is the x-ray before and after, and you see the intimate contact of uh, the biodentin with the dental tissue we have a perfect adaptation and we will have a good result then you ask the patient to you dismiss the patient and we keep in contact with the patient the following day and one week later and then we can wait up to six weeks to make sure that we don't have any signs of pain or symptoms that indicate the removal of uh, the pulp and this means that we have a success pulp capping treatment. So now back to biodentin. How do we use it? As I told you, you just open the um, uh, container whenever you want to use it. You remove the uh, foil and then you count very gently five drops of liquid inside the capsule. You open the capsule, you hold it tightly, you put five drops and then you close again the capsule and you put it in the vibrator for 30 seconds. And once you open it, you need to have a creamy appearance of this material that is very nice to be applied. You can apply it using a plastic spatula or you can apply it using an amalgam carrier that is very uh, convenient to use it. But you need to be very gentle not to push too much the material with pressure, mostly if you have an exposed pulp. This is another trick also. And this was uh, something that I was doing because one problem that we found with the biodentin in the early version was that sometimes this powder contained uh, big uh, size fillers inside and this was due to the manufacturer. So one advice is to take a spatula, you put it inside and you try to remove it. If you have big uh, particles like this one, you crash them on a glass slide and you put them inside and this will ensure a more uniform a consistency of the material to have it really like you want. So you crash, as I told you, the uh, big particles and you put them inside the uh, capsule. You put the water and again, be very careful, just count five drops of water and you put the capsule of biodentin in uh, the vibrator. And as you can see, you need to vibrate it during uh, 30 seconds and this will ensure the uniformity of the material. And this is also another case where we see it from A to Z, how it goes. It was also a deep carries, as you can see under this small amalgam where we had two exposures. So it was not very complicated because we had walls. So we just had to take one capsule of bio bulk biodentin and we filled all the cavity. And when the patient came back several weeks after, you could see that all the margins and the limit of the cavity 
are still in very good uh, shape. We don't have any fracture. The only thing is the color of the biodentin changed slightly, and this is quite normal due to all the uh, coloring that the patient may uh, have uh, eaten or taken during his uh, normal life. So what to do? Once you have a good sign that there is no, um, the pulp is vital and everything is okay, then you need to drill very easily a cavity in the biodentin. So you take a burr, and if, like you are drilling a normal cavity in the enamel, you just drill a cavity. No need to drill more than two millimeters. So you don't just take care of drilling. Then you put your etching, your bonding, and you place your composite on biodentin. And this is a very nice x-ray showing the intimate contact of biodentin with the pulp of this uh, tooth. And this is also another case, a more severe uh, aggressive caries, as you see in another patient. So we had to remove the caries slowly using an excavator. Then we uh, removed uh, the cleaned and we placed the biodentin on the left side. And you see after several weeks, again, how this material can be preserved very nicely. And we just uh, saw um, that the material could be removed. So again, you drill a cavity, you remove, you expose as much as you can enamel on the occlusal part, and you keep your layer of bio bulk biodentin in the uh, deep part of the cavity and you place your composite. Here is another case also, and with a very nice follow up up to 10 years, as I will show you. This was a young patient that I was treating by the time he was 17 years old and he had a very high carriage risk. So, what I did for some is of his uh, carries. I had chosen to use biodentin. This was a new material and it looked very promising. So what I did, I placed a layer of biodentin, as you can see on the X-ray, and this is a one-year follow-up. You could see the difference of radio opacity between the composite and the biodentin on the X-ray. Everything was uh, going perfectly. And this is after eight years, you could see that we started to see some um, discontinuity on the mesial margin of this cavity and the patient came back after 10 years had fractured a small piece of uh, composite so what we did a small repair i decided to remove all the composite to clean and look how nice is the um, biodentin still preserved after 10 years so the only thing i did i etched again my cavity i placed my bonding one layer i light cured my bonding and i placed my composite and this is the case again for another few years going and we still have a vital pulp and the patient is still very happy and he is 10 years older now. Now also this is another case with five years of biodentin placed under composite and when what you can see close to this blue arrow is the biodentin that was placed in an open sandwich and this is very interesting indication because you see that we had a deep cavity and deep margin located really almost below the gum so what I did I placed a good matrix and I placed my layer of biodentin uh, over there and after several weeks same technique I removed a layer of biodentin and I placed a composite and you see that we still have a very good result. Also in pediatric dentistry as I mentioned uh, earlier this is a very good indication as you can see in this kind of restoration where we clean as much as we can of this decay taking care of not uh, exposing the pulp and this is another technique of placing uh, biodentin. As I told you, you take this small spatula and you place it gently inside and you will start to see a shiny appearance on the surface. This is due to the first primary setting mechanism. And what you can do, you can take a small cotton pellet and remove the excess water and keep the material to set. You clean the surrounding uh, margin of the cavity and after 10 to 15 minutes, you may release the patient. And of course, you inform the patient not to eat or to drink before an hour after placing the biodentin. So we make sure that we have a good setting of the material. Now, in more severe cases where we are uh, brought to perform what we call pulpotomy on permanent teeth, and this is a technique that we are using more and more. So it is the same uh, situation. We have a caries, but this time the caries is deeper. And as you can see, we uh, don't have a situation where we can perform a direct pulp capping because to perform a direct pulp capping, we need to make sure that we have a small pulpal exposure. While in this case, you see that the caries was very big. 
So what I have decided to do is to perform a pulpotomy, and this consists of opening an axis cavity of drilling the uh, pulp of the pulpal chamber of the crown using a, a clean carbide round burr and to don't touch at all the entrance of the canals. So the only thing I do to perform some hemostasis also using a cotton pellet and then you fill all the axis cavity using biodentine and you place a permanent or a semi-permanent restoration. In this case, I placed a glass ionomer on these tools, as you can see, and then you send the patient home for several uh, weeks to make sure that we have uh, vitality of the pulp. And it looks like this is giving really very good results. And we will try to see on the X-ray, you see that we have a perfect adaptation biodentine. It has a low or medium radio opacity, we can say very close to dentine. So sometimes you need to be very careful. As you can see on this X-ray, you see that we have a full, a big, thick layer of biodentine placed in this cavity, in, and you see it just in contact with the uh, entrance of the canals. And on the top, I placed a small layer of glass ionomer. Concerning the handling of biodentine, we know that we uh, have the mixing procedure is not always easy. So you need to adapt your mixing time according to your vibrator, and you need always to make sure that you don't have big fillers inside, as I told you previously. You apply the material in the cavity without pressure, gently in order not to make any pressure, excess pressure on the pulp. And it has relatively short to medium setting time, but you need to leave it before placing your composite for a few days, as you will see later on. As I mentioned also, biodentin has a low radio opacity and resistance to wear. So we cannot leave it for permanently in uh, the tools of the patient. So after several uh, weeks or two or three months, we need to replace if the patient is traveling, for instance, if we are not able to see the patient in the coming weeks, you need to inform him that he needs to come back after two or three months to replace the uh, temporary uh, or to remove a part of this biodentin and place a composite on the top of it. So now let's go a little bit into the literature to see what uh, are the publications, because it's always interesting to combine or to confirm our clinical findings with some papers that was published and that strengthen our uh, clinical uh, outcome. So now this is a paper that was published in the International Journal of Endo about a full pulpotomy using biodentine on uh, permanent teeth. This was uh, conducted, I think, in Jordan. And they conducted the research on 64 permanent molars with symptomatic vital pulps in 52 patients aged between 19 and 69 years uh, old. After two days, they had a success of 93.8, no uh, pain for uh, those patients. And at six months, we had 98.4% clinical and radiographic success. And this is quite a huge uh, number, which signs a very good uh, success. At one year, 59 of 63 attended recall with 100% clinical and 90.4 radiographic success. Of course, it is only at one year, but it looks that it is very promising. So we need to monitor and to make sure that the patient are able to come to confirm that this is working on long term. And full pulpotomy using biodentine. So the conclusion were that biodentine was successful as a therapeutic material in full pulpotomy treatment of adult teeth with carious exposure. And the clinical signs and symptoms indicative of partial irreversible pulpitis are not a contraindication. Full pulpotomy might be considered as an alternative treatment approach to root canal treatment because, as I said, we are not touching the canals. We are just removing the pulp chamber pulp and replacing it with biodentin. This is another paper also that was published uh, recently about the pulpotomy using biodentin, and this time on primary teeth and not on permanent teeth. So we can see that it is working on uh, both uh, type of teeth. And the vital pulpotomy on, was performed on 44 mandibular primary molars with carious exposure that were divided into two groups. So in this study, they compared the MTA group to the biodentine group with 20 cases. With the MTA, they used 24 cases. And the treatment was followed up clinically and radiographically for two years, for 24 months. And what were the conclusion? So the pulpotomy treatment using biodentine and MTA had similar success rates in primary teeth at 24 months follow-up. 
this is very good. And then also they concluded that the shorter setting time and easier handling of biodentine may make it, it preferred alternative to MTA. Also, other indication of uh, biodentine, but are not really in the scope of this biobulk, but could be also a very good indication. Since you have it in your office, you could extend the use of biodentine other than uh, restorative dentistry and uh, bio biobulk in uh, uh, pulp and direct and indirect pulp capping. You can use it in some endodontic uh, application, like as the treatment of perforation. As you can see over there, you take a small amalgam carrier and you place some biodentine in the perforation, also in the treatment of cervical resorption, you can use biodentine, a lot of indication, and also in the treatment of uh, repair of perforation, as you can see over there, it could be a very good indication. So we see that also when we place biodentine on, uh, con in contact with the pulp, we have a good proliferation, migration, and adhesion of human dental pulp stem cells. So this was also published in 2014, and it shows that biodentine has a very positive influence on human dental pulp stem cells. This is also another interesting paper that was published uh, about the direct pulp capping using pro-root mineral, uh, mineral trap uh, oxide aggregate versus biodentine and permanent teeth with various pulp exposure. And again, they have selected 59 carelessly exposed permanent teeth with diagnosis of normal pulp, irreversible pulpitis, and exposure size up to 2.5 millimeter, which is pretty bigger than what is uh, indicated. And each patient with only one carious exposed tooth was randomly allocated or a pro root MTA or a biodentine restoration, and patients were recalled every six months during 18 months, so three times. The results were as follows. So compared with ProRoot MTA, biodentine showed 96.4 percentage of success, uh, non-inferior success for this material at, uh, with patients from 6 to 18 years old. However, biodentine did not cause any great discoloration in the study and may be recommended for um, dental pulp capping in the aesthetic zone. So also, this is very interesting. So now I move to the other part that is the continuum. We have placed our biobulk, biodentine, or other materials, and now we need to replace this or to fill permanently this cavity. As you can see on this slide, you see that we have placed our layer of uh, biodentine, and you can see the SEM showing the fillers, dispersion in this material, and then we need to replace one layer of uh, biodentine by a composite. Here we have two options. It's exactly like if you are building you can have the choice to use a conventional layering technique of placing the composite, or you can adopt the bulk concrete technique where we have or a composite that is placed using a, a plugger, as I, uh, you can see in this slide, or according to the bulk concept. What is the bulk concept in restorative density? In restorative density, we have been uh, using and hearing a lot about those material that started on the market since almost um, 10 years. And we started with maybe 10 or 12 materials. And today we have more than 30 bulk restorative materials available. We could classify those materials in one publication that I made with Professor McConnell that was published in Journal of Dentistry in 2017. We could classify those bulk fill materials or techniques into two main groups. The bulk materials that can be used as base and that need to be topped by composite. And this group includes two uh, versions or two subgroups. One, the flowable base on which we need to add the composite or the fiber-based materials on which we need to add the composite. The other group of bulk fill consists of a high viscosity bulk fill material that can be used to fill all the cavity. And it can present or in a syringe like any normal composite or in a sonically activated system. The big advantage of bulk fill technique is, like the name indicates, it can be placed in layers of four millimeters instead of two millimeters. So this is supposed to represent a good gain of time. And if we uh, want to classify or to visualize clinically from a clinical point of view, how can we use those techniques of bulk fill? We have also published a paper in a French-speaking journal, very interesting, and I really invite you to read this very uh, re, uh, new version of this uh, 
journal Biomaterial Clinique that uh, we started to publish with uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Attal since five years almost. And we uh, have published two papers about those materials. And within this journal, we have a series of three papers about biodentine, also very interesting. So we can see that we have three ways of using bio, uh, sorry, of using bulk field techniques with no coverage, if you are using a high viscosity material or with a full coverage or occlusal coverage. So very uh, briefly, just to show you some examples of each material, the flowable bulk field also includes a big variety of materials available today from 3M, from BOPO, from GC, from several companies, where you are supposed to place a layer of flowable bulk and you leave 1.5 or 2 millimeters to place a normal composite that is more resistant and provide more aesthetic. The other group is the fiber-based bulk field base from GC. It is a fiber-based material, as you can see, that contains big fibers that can go up to one millimeter. And those fibers are supposed to play a significant role in stopping crack propagation. This is the last uh, group where we have the high viscosity of bulk field material. And as I mentioned, if you look from the outside in a box, it contains a series of composites. Maybe you cannot differentiate it. The only thing is you need to read carefully if this is a conventional composite or a bulk field composite. Because if it's a bulk field, then you can allow yourself to light your four millimeters of uh, materials in one shot. Now, this is the last uh, subgroup with the high viscosity bulk field material. It is called the sonically activated bulk material. It's called the sonic field. Cavo is manufacturing the handpiece and Kerr is manufacturing the composite. So it's a closed system because you need to have both devices to ensure the use of this material. So the clinical indication of bulk field materials are mainly in posterior restorative material in class one and class two, and it can be used as well as build up techniques to reconstruct a missing cast or after a bio uh, bulk field technique or as a base after an endodontic treatment. So you see that we have several indications. I have picked up two cases very quickly. This is a typical case of a root canal treatment performed in a sound motor. We just opened an axis cavity. And in this case, we know that we are allowed to place a composite. So we have placed a fiber-based material after placing the adhesive inside the cavity. And we extrude this material. And you see that this material is quite stiff because it is uh, supposed to fill the cavity and be very resistant. So we apply it and we leave 1.5 millimeter after light curing, of course, and then we can place a normal uh, hybrid composite on the last 1.5 millimeter to ensure a protection of those fibers and a good occlusal contact. This is another case that was performed using Sonic Fill 2. We uh, had failure under this amalgam and it carries, as you can see on the second molar on the mesial side. So we cleaned, we opened, and we polish and this is how it looks like so of course this represents if we know to select which kind of bulk field material we can have a good gain of time so very briefly what have changed with those bulk field materials why we could as of a sudden light cure four millimeters of composite instead of two so this could be summarized in the four main criteria. First, we had some change made in the type and percentage of photo initiators, some change in the fillers and their percentage. The shade of those materials are more translucent, better light penetration within this material. Inside this could be gathered from the different uh, manufacturers and can summarize and explain why we could polymerize this material up to four millimeters. Now, my last part that I would cover and discuss with you is a very critical question that you are surely asking. And of course, I was asking myself this question and I will try to answer very easily and very concisely. And that is the adhesion between the biobulk, biodentin and composite. Is it working? Is there an adhesion? Let's see how this will work. So basically, every bulk field system 
placement of the composite. And here you can pick up one of your adhesive according to adhesive, self edge adhesive, or whatever you want. You place your adhesive, of course, after cutting your cavity and you place your composite. So this is a typical case after performing the class to uh, biodentine. I place my matrix, of course, all the devices, and I place my composite, as you can see, on the right side. This will definitely ensure a good longevity of the restoration. This is another case of a class two use. This was also a young on the distal side. So I uh, placed the biodentine for several weeks. And on this X-ray, you could see very clearly the layer of biodentine below the uh, dashed line. And on the upper part, I have placed a layer of composite after several weeks when I was sure that all signs of sensitivity or no pain was detected. I checked the vitality of the pulp and then I placed my composite. And look, after eight years, this barkle composite is behaving. It is still there. Of course, we lost some uh, the gloss of this material, this was the sonic film, I guess, and, but you see that the margins are still in continuity and this ensures the longevity of the material. No secondary caries, no sensitivity, so this definitely means that there is a bonding between the composite and the biodentine. So let's try to see what does the literature say. There are a lot of papers about this topic, but I have just three of them recent shows that we have a bonding between the biodentine and the composite. Let's look uh, closely to the first paper. This paper examined the effect of biodentine maturation time on the resin bond strengths when aged in artificial saliva. So what is interesting is that they made samples of biodentine, as you see the blue discs, and on those discs of biodentine, they have bonded discs of composite in uh, red or uh, uh, pink color and they did the same experience at after 12 minutes after 14 days and after 28 days and what was concluded from the study is that the exposure of biodentin to an acid with low ph could disturb the chemical setting by affecting the hydration of three calcium silicate and of course the acidity of the etching might be buffered by biodentin and the most important conclusion was that the best time for placement of an overlying composite restoration is at 14 days, where we have a perfect maturation of biodentine. This is a second study where we had a comparison between the bonding strengths of self-adhering bulk global composite to MTA, to dical, to biodentine, and to theracal. This is also interesting because we have a wide variety of different uh, materials used for pulp capping, including the biobulk, the biodentine. So those are the four groups. They used four pulp capping materials, MTA, dical, biodentine, and theracal, and they used two types of composite for restoration. They used a self-adhesive, that is the dyad flow or the vertus flow in other countries. And in the other group, they used the SDR applied with an adhesive. And those are the results. We see that we had the biodentine, the Theracal gave the highest values, bonding adhesion values, and on biodentine, the SDR gave also the second highest value. So this proved that we have a good adhesion between those materials. Both uh, self-adhering flowable composites and bulk field flowable composites showed the highest shear bond strength with Theracal, followed by biodentine, and the bulk field flowable composite bonded better than the self-adhering flowable composite in comparison using the same pulp capping agent. Finally, this uh, study also pointed out the bond strength of biodentin to a resin-based composite at various etching times and with different adhesive strategies. So they played on changing the etching time that could bring uh, better adhesion or not, and they also used two different types of adhesive from the same manufacturer, from Curare. They used a self etch adhesive, a two bottles or one bottle, and always with biodentine. And you see that we had uh, good results, 6.42 megapascal with uh, the Clearfield 3 uh, S3. So this was one step. And the conclusion were the following. The self etch bonding system allowed for greater shear bond strength in a shorter application time, and we obtained greater bond strength when we applied one layer of adhesive because some of you would 
think that if you apply two layers of th or three layers of adhesive, we are improving the bond strength, which is not true at all. Even with normal composite, there is no need to place several layers uh, to improve the adhesion, except if the manufacturer will mention this, but otherwise no need to do it. One layer placed properly will ensure a good adhesion for this. Now we can conclude with very uh, small take home messages. The best root canal filling, remember, is healthy pulp tissue. So whenever you can preserve pulp vitality, please do it. Biodentine looks after 10 years of clinical experience, a very promising material that allows to save time and preserve pulp vitality. And bulk fill materials are today recognized as a real class of materials and could be used as a continuum for biobulk. I thank you very much for your kind attention. This is my email, and I would be happy to answer uh, your question. Oh, we are back now after this uh, uh, this lecture. Uh, let's move now to the second part of uh, of the webinar, so of a live session. Um, before starting the question and answer with Professor Sabag, um, we want to hear uh, a little bit from you. So uh, I will send you some uh, questions. So please um, answer to the question. It will appear on your screen. So please uh, answer to the question. You will have 15 seconds to answer. So uh, the first, uh, first question, uh, did you already use the bio bulk fill technique? You have 15 minutes, 15 seconds, sorry, to answer. Please select yes or no. Okay, it's closed. Now let's see your, your results. So you are 14% of already using biobalfield technique and 60% 60, 60 no. Um, Professor Sabag, maybe you can uh, tell us and remind us what are the benefits of a biobalfield technique? So as we saw, uh, good evening, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. So as we saw, the benefit of the biobulk uh, technique is mainly to keep uh, the pulp vital because we know if we need to do the root canal treatment, we know that we have a good success rate, but then we need to think about the restoration. We are weakening uh, the axis cavity, we are weakening the tooth. So we need to think about uh, the preservation of tooth structure and of course, this is depending on the age of the patient. So it's uh, now more and more discussed to keep uh, the uh, vitality of the pulp, even though with some uh, pulpitis, and we see that we have also some uh, publications that are coming and mm -hmm. are also discussing uh, the pulp regeneration as well. So this is really represents uh, state of the art and the future of uh, dentistry. Thank you. So let's switch to the to the second question. Again, 15 seconds to answer. When you have a, a pulp capping uh, procedure, do you always use the same restorative material? Yes or no? One second left. Let's see now your answer. So you are 48% to always use the same and at 52% uh, not using the same. Uh, so it's quite uh, equal. What do you think about that, Professor Sabag? Well, when you see that a lot of people are using the same restorative material or half of the attendees are using half of the restorative material, by this you mean the same restorative as a pulp protection, uh, Emily, or uh, combining two materials together? Uh, the same for the pulp, just pulp capping, not combining. Sorry? Not combining, just, just one, just one material. Uh, just one material, yeah. I, I think uh, this can be 
also done, but then we need to think about the final restoration that you are doing because you need also to avoid having a lot of interfaces and then getting the patient back in order to open and to remove the temporary and then putting again uh, the final restoration. So again, we can hurt the pulp, we can hurt the pulp if we are uh, opening again and uh, um, delivering anesthesia and the risk is to break the dental bridge that is starting to get formed. This is the problem if we do it in uh, two times. Last, uh, last question before uh, your question, so prepare your question. Last one. Um, when you manage uh, a pulp capping procedure, do you restore in one or two sessions? And second left. I close the, the poll and I share with you. So it's like the, the, the last question, quite equal. I think, it, Professor yeah. Savag, it depends, of course, of the, of the procedure. It depends on the procedure and the material we are using. But again, it's funny to see that we have almost uh, the same result. So again, I think that when we can uh, use uh, the same uh, one session, it uh, would be optimal also. But again, it depends on uh, the age of the patient and on the technique that uh, we are doing. So uh, there are, in fact, a lot of factors that are influencing uh, the choice of the procedure. But whenever we can uh, do it in uh, one session, also it is uh, advisable to to do it. Or otherwise, we can do it in two sessions. But the big advantage of uh, bio bulk filling, like biodentin, is that we are not removing or we don't have any risk of um, disturbing the uh, forming uh, dentin bridge because there is a thick layer of biodentin that is placed and there is no risk to disturb the uh, cicatrization or the healing process because we need to drill just two millimeters to place a composite. So this is giving a lot of protection for the pulp and for the dentin bridge. Thank you. Um, now we can uh, move to the question. Already lots, uh, lots of questions. So I just switched to the <laughs> to the questions. Um, let me just one minute. So uh, first one. Um, one attendees wants your confirmation that biodentin can work with irreversible pulpitis. Uh, sorry, Emily, can you say it again? What is? Um, if you confirm that biodentin can be used for irreversible pulpitis. Uh, for irreversible, irreversible pulpitis, um, I think there is a publication that is coming soon uh, that is showing uh, this. I think it's a new topic that we need to confirm. I have a few cases that are, are done right now, but we cannot say that it is uh, really working 100% because we have a lot of factors involved in these uh, cases as well. But as we see, the age of the patient, of course, is uh, very important if the patient has some uh, um, health issues, so all those parameters, indication and contraindication needs to be analyzed very carefully prior to starting uh, such a treatment, but we can say that we are on the good way. Um, how much time I should wait for the biodentin to set completely on share side? We need to wait between 10 to uh, 14 minutes before sending the patient back home. So we need to wait 12 to 14 minutes. And you need to ask the patient during the first hour not to eat or not to drink for uh, extra setting for the biodentin. Another question about the timing. What about applying Vitrobon over the biodentin before the 12 minutes set time to be able to proceed with direct restoration without having to wait the full 12 minutes? Uh, yeah, uh, sometimes we think that this could be an option, but the problem is if uh, you want to put uh, Vitrobon, the problem is we don't have a full setting of the biodentin. 
I heard some people did it, or even they have placed some uh, glass ionomer, not uh, only uh, vitrobon. You can do it, but I mean, and then you can restore in one session. I personally don't do it. I prefer to have a complete setting of the biodentine, and then the patient uh, comes back for uh, the second stage restoration. I usually cover biodentine with composite at the same visit. After your lecture, it seems to be better to wait 14 days. Should I really change my protocol? Yes, if you can wait, it's better. If you are uh, having, well, it depends what kind of uh, adhesive you are using. Of course, if you are using a uh, self edge uh, adhesive, then you are not rinsing, you are not using phosphoric acid, then it is okay. But basically, uh, it is better to wait for the full setting of uh, the biodentine if you want to have an interaction with the biodentine. Because the risk is, if biodentine is not totally set, is to have less adhesion and uh, to have an unstable interface with the material. Can we leave biodentine as a final restoration and not top, uh, top it up with, with composite? No, we said uh, this uh, needs to be replaced. While we can wait, it depends if you have a class one or a class two, because this is also regarding the mechanical resistance and stability of the cavity. But basically, it has been proven that biodentine can uh, stay in the cavity for up to six months, but afterwards it needs to be changed or topped by some composite for better resistance because it has a tendency to uh, stain and maybe to fracture after six months. Closing the perforation with biobulk film material, as you mentioned, is it success successful on the long term? Yes, of course. Uh, there are a lot of indications for endodontics. I have just uh, covered that indication of restorative density, but personally, I have uh, done several cases of perforation with biodentine, and it really works great. Um, question again about uh, the timing when you when you leave biodentine. As, are there any observation of leaving biodentine above the limited time of stain? Above the limited time of? Of stay. If you if you let biodentine more than uh, uh, of timing. If you if you let, let yeah. If we leave it after six months, then it depends. Again, if you have a class one cavity, the results, of course, are better than if you have a class two cavity because the class two cavity would tend to break a little bit and to be less resistant mechanically. But if you are working with a class one, then uh, it will be working. But I personally never leave it more than uh, a couple of months in case the patient is traveling. But it's always uh, necessary to replace it because the wear resistance of biodentine is not also uh, very strong on the long time, after six months, I mean. Um, a question regarding the disinfection of the cavity. Which product do you recommend to, to disinfect the cavity? Uh, usually, we disinfect the cavity. If we are working, we must work on the rubber dam. So we must not uh, use, uh, uh, I mean, uh, contaminant if we are uh, working with this. Otherwise, we can use some chlorhexidine if you want to do some decontamination at the low percentage, 2% or so 0.2. Uh, gently with a cotton pellet, you uh, use it to disinfect the cavity if you want to do it prior to placing your composite. A question on um, the open sandwich technique that you mentioned. Uh, does it have a good prognosis, the open sandwich technique? Uh, the open sandwich technique, it has a good prognosis because it has been protected by the composite, of course. And the advantage is uh, that it is biocompatible and it doesn't create any uh, gingival inflammation if you are placing uh, the material. And I did not observe with the cases that I have done neither sensitivity, because this means that the material is uh, sealing the cavity and we don't observe any um, sensitivity on uh, this uh, side, the proximal side. And from the occlusal side, we have placed a layer of composite that is supposed to uh, protect and to support the occlusal wear and the occlusal uh, load of the cavity. And the last question, 
Um, it's again uh, regarding uh, the, the timing. Uh, is it better to leave by in 14 days or three to six months? Um, in, it, it, independently of biodentin or not, what we are looking for for waiting for four weeks is to make sure that we don't have any clinical signs and that the patient does not need to have a root canal treatment because we know that if we do direct pulp capping, in case I will consider or discuss the direct pulp capping, we have a risk of failures. Sometimes it's 20, 30 percent according to the indication, to the age of the patient, and to the size of the exposure. We did not discuss um, all those uh, issues. So uh, 14 days is for the full setting of biodentin. Then if you don't have any pain at 14 days, of course, you can move to the final restoration because basically uh, on the short term, failure of direct pulp capping will occur during the two to first three weeks. In the literature, it is advised to wait one month and a half before placing the final restoration. But if at two weeks you uh, have no clinical signs, you can go and place your final uh, restoration. Ah, some questions uh, are coming again. So let's, last, last, last one. Uh, which could be a right way to apply biodentin after pulpectomy if there is a pulp bleeding? If there is a pulp bleeding, it means there is an inflammation. It is not indicated because this is one of the main uh, indications uh, that we have. So we need to stop the bleeding naturally. As I mentioned, we need to apply a slight pressure with a cotton pellet. We must not use any um, products to uh, stop the bleeding. Otherwise, this means that the pulp is really at an advanced stage of inflammation and we have very low chances that it will work. So we need to consider when we do this kind of uh, restoration, when the bleeding is, cannot be uh, controlled, it means that we have an irreversible pulpitis. Professor Sabak, thank you very much. We come to, to the end of uh, this webinar. Thank you all for your participation. Um, please answer to the satisfaction survey. It will be of great help. And uh, see you soon for the next uh, Septodon webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and see you soon.